Who is the best heavyweight boxer of all time? If you know anything about the sweet science, you know how incredibly stacked both the 70s and 90s heavyweight divisions were. The 70s had the holy rock, paper, scissors trinity of Ali, Frazier, and Foreman. The 90s had all the answers to Mike Tyson's dominance in the 80s. Quite the mosh pit of talent and accomplishments between the two eras. Now, I've covered both of these eras in detail in the form of retrospective documentaries, you know the drill, links in the description. So, what if? What if we brought the best of the best together inside of one bracket? That means dream matches, title unifications, and most importantly, no politics. Every fighter will be at their absolute apex, and though I'll be giving my opinion on who would win the fights, Fight Night Champion will decide the winner. Now for the championships. We'll have six titles, the Lineal, Ring, WBC, WBA, IBF, and WBO titles. The top four overall seeded fighters will compete for the alphabet titles against their opposite ended opponents. The lineage and ring recognition will be decided between seeds 7 through 10. Six overall rounds in the tournament. Goody, let's get into the fighters. Ten heavyweights apiece. The number 10 spot for each decade is a three-man, 15-rounder wildcard mini-tournament. The number 10 ranked fighters from my retrospectives will face off against the winner of the wildcard to determine the 10th fighter for their respective decade. Up first from the 70s. Truly the greatest of all time. Not even solely speaking as a boxer, but as a human being. He needs no introduction in or out of the ring, but as a short recap, he won gold in the 1960 Olympics, shook up the world in 64 against Liston, dominated the division until he was unjustly exiled, overcame his conquerors in Frazier and Norton, shook up the world again in 74 against Foreman, dominated the division again while being well past his best and winning important rubber matches along the way, and won the title for an unprecedented third time against the man who took it from him. He fought everyone, and he darn near beat everyone. The only losses he didn't avenge were the ones where he had no business being in the ring any longer against Holmes and Burbick. The Muhammad Ali of contention will have the supernatural stamina and ability of the 60s Cassius Clay paired with the superhuman toughness, wisdom, and experience of the 70s Muhammad Ali. In other words, this is the Muhammad Ali that we never got to see from 1967 to 1970. Larry Holmes may be the most criminally underappreciated and underrated heavyweight of all time. Had it not been for the timing of his dominance, he'd be placed rightfully in even casual minds as one of the true all-time greats. Holmes and Norton fought a close one and absolutely should have had a rematch, but it never came to be because of Norton's crushing loss to Shavers. Holmes overcame the odds not once but twice against Shavers. He crushed the hype of Jerry Cooney, and I have him beating the man directly under him in this listing. Holmes is one of two fighters that I have potentially beating a peak Ali. The other man belongs to the 90s. The Larry Holmes that will take part in this tournament will have the overall ability and dominance of his prime self coupled with the experience and wit he held in his second career. Big George once said something to the tune of Joe Lewis being the best and Ali being the greatest. But there's a legitimate argument for George Foreman being the greatest of all time in his own right. Two careers. 
Two different fighters. Two different men. One amazing grill. Maybe the greatest heel to face turn from intimidating monster to cool uncle grandpa figure. The man was Sonny Liston, sparring partner at one point, and was trained by Archie Moore. Emmanuel Stewart talked of how underrated George was as a boxer, given his power overshadowed his tactics and defensive skill. He cleaned the division out before Muhammad Ali had to be the one to stop him. Came back and showed he could hang with the new crop in what is known as an era right up there with the 70s as far as competition. 20 years after the Rumble in the Jungle, he shocks the world in his own right by becoming the oldest heavyweight champion in history, even wearing the same trunks he wore the night he originally lost it. Something else we tend to overlook about that night, too, is how Foreman employed his own form of rope -a dope by goading Michael Moore in a standing toe to toe with him. His work in and out of the ring speaks for itself. And the only things we're missing are some dream bouts against the likes of Ernie Shavers, Mike Tyson, Riddick Bowe, and Lennox Lewis. All that being said, the foreman of contention here has the youth and power of the 70s foreman with the patience, experience, and stamina of the 90s foreman. God bless George Foreman, and may he continue to live long. the hardest working man in boxing behind maybe only Rocky Marciano. This version of Frazier could compete against any heavyweight across history and would have fared far better against the man he was tailor-made for in George Foreman. This Frazier is the exact one from the fight of the century against Muhammad Ali in 1971 that fought so hard he allegedly lost 10 pounds by the time the fight was over. No one wanted it more than Smokin' Joe. I considered his performances against Bonavina, Quarry, and Foster, but the show he put on against Ali was a mosh pit of said matchups, producing an absolute peak Joe Frazier, a very rare occurrence in boxing. Sonny Liston is the exception to my rules in that he was around when most of these 70s heavyweights were fighting, but he only fought once in the 70s himself. Still, he's way too good to leave off due to his dominance, his close proximity era-wise, and his dream match potential. The Liston of contention here will be the one that dominated the Big Cat Cleveland Williams and Floyd Patterson. As a bonus, who have the youth he never got to use as champion because of how hard he was ducked and avoided by the contenders of the 50s. Kenny Norton read a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and he never looked back. It propelled him to reach such heights as beating Muhammad Ali in 1973 and finally becoming champion in 1978. That war with Larry Holmes could have and probably should have gone his way due to champion's advantage. He had the body of a bodybuilder and never came into a fight out of shape. The man was even an ex-marine. Sluggers were his weakness, but he could box with the best. He was the kryptonite to the greatest. Of course, the Ken Norton in this tournament will be a mosh pit of the one who beat Ali Quarry, Bobbick, and Young, along with the one who arguably beat Ali the third time and Holmes in their 1978 bout. The Bellflower Bomber fought the best win, lose, or draw. He feared no one and did it all in an era that might be the most competitive in the history of the sport. Back then, you were viewed highly if you did such. Record aside, he may not have been the best at anything, but he could certainly hold his own. Had he won more of his bouts, he would be much higher on the list. The quarry of choice will be the one who stopped Ernie Shavers in the first round. He gets bonus stats from his wins over Ron Lyle, 
and Floyd Patterson as well. Ronnie Lyle fought Ali, Shavers, and Foreman all back to back. This man had served hard time and didn't fear a soul. He managed to beat Shavers in their slugfest. Now imagine if he'd beaten Foreman too. He'd certainly be ranked higher. Another fighter I've got to list being at his best in a loss. The war with George Foreman should have killed both of those gladiators, but thank goodness they lived to fight another day. Our Ron Lyle will be the one from the stated three fights. Shavers had two shortcomings that derailed him from joining the elites. His chin and his stamina. He is widely agreed upon as being the hardest hitting fighter of all time, trumping even Liston and Foreman. But that wasn't enough to get him over the hill to championship glory. Still, he did some good work in the division, and I'm going to go with the Shavers that blasted Ken Norton out in 1979. Bonus points have to come from his wars with Holmes and his 15-rounder against Ali. Alright, the 70s wild card fight. Leon Spinks had one real high point, and that was beating Muhammad Ali just one year after he turned pro. Now, Spinks only fought three years in the 70s, but he didn't do much in the 80s outside of getting TKO'd by Larry Holmes in 1981. Therefore, he gets the 70s nod because that's where his crowning and only achievement lies, and that's obviously our version of Leon. Jimmy Young arguably beat Ali and did beat Foreman. He fought to a draw with Shavers, though many felt he'd won that fight. Young also beat Ron Lau twice. He lost some close decisions and the Ali loss is the point of purpose here in that Spinks did beat Ali. Our version of Young would be a fusion of the one who beat Lyle and Foreman, lost to Ali and Norton, and fought to a draw with Shavers. If Young wins the 70s wild card and beats the waiting Joe Bugner, he's taking the number 7 spot after Norton and before Quarry. If Spinks wins, he's taking the number 10 spot. I predict that Jimmy Young will prevail over Spinks, but fall to Buckner. The first wild card bout is a battle that never came to be, until now. The pressure of Leon Spinks meets the stinging counter skill of Jimmy Young. Young kept the bout under his control via a good jab, he also managed to stun Spinks on multiple occasions through the first four rounds. In the fourth, Spinks was cut by a sharp shot from Young and would escape the round on shaky legs. Spinks returned on said shaky legs in the fifth and was dropped by Young twice before he failed to answer the referee's count of ten. And with this win, Jimmy Young will take the wild card spot and engage Joe Bugner for the number ten spot. And now for the answer to the final fighter of the 70s. The bout between Ozzy Joe Buckner and Jimmy Young. Again, I predict that Joe Buckner will get the underdog win here. The two started strong before backing off one another and engaging in a scrappy battle mixing in both in and out fighting. Buckner was the aggressor walking Young down. The second round saw Young step up his efforts, but remain on the back foot as he looked for counter opportunities. Still, Bugner's aggression was getting the better of Young. In the third, Young looked to use his jab more effectively as he continued on the back foot. He was making Bugner miss more often and being more effective with his slips and counters. Both men were tying one another up after tagging one another up close, refusing to break out into brawls. Heading into the fourth, Bugner had a narrow lead and remained aggressive. Young took advantage and continued to score better while taking some tough shots from Joe. A short brawl broke out on the ropes a minute and a half into the round that extended to a counter punch off to end the round. Good round for Young, who continued to come on harder in the fifth. As Young figured out Joe's rhythm, 
Bugner tied him up before he could score heavy, resetting the action. The Six saw the chess match continue as both men switched from aggressive to countering. Both started aggressive in the eighth, trading blows mid-range. Young was getting the better of the standoffs with his effective slips and counters. Bugner got some good shots in during the ninth, but Young evened the affair. Still, Joe was landing some good shots and forced Young to cover up. Solid round for Bugner. Bugner stunned Young with a big right hook in the 10th, but Young survived and continued exchanging with Bugner. Young got some good shots in to close the round. Entering the 11th, it was an even fight. They continued trading blows as Young snuck in two good counters a minute and a half or so in. The round ended with Bugner failing to hurt and exhausting Young. Bugner's face was showing the casualties of the war. The 12th saw good spurts from both. The 13th saw Bugner continue whipping on hurting Young. Young did the same, failing to punish the tiring Bugner who was throwing wildly. Both were aggressive in the 14th, but Young was getting the better of the exchanges. Bugner had Young backing up as the 14th wound down, but again whiffed. The 15th and final round saw both men swing away with Joe pressuring a seemingly desperate Young. Both were hurting one another, leading to the end, where Young whiffed on stunning Joe badly. In the end, Bugner was awarded a very close split decision, and he'll be taking his well-earned place at number 10 for the 70s. Up first from the 90s, the resented best pugilist of his era. Lewis has a plethora of fights to choose from in which he shined bright. Razor Ruddock, Mike Tyson, Vitaly Klitschko, Ray Mercer. But the Galata fight showed what a Lewis who came out fast and ready to destroy was all about. He could have blitzed anyone like this and it's terrifying to think of. Oh, and remember, when I said I could see only two men beating a Peak Ali? Lewis is the other. In my opinion, Lennox is the best heavyweight since Larry Holmes. The Lewis of choice here will be a fusion of the one who beat Ruddick, Bruno, and Tucker, went to war with Mercer, and blitzed Galata. You know the drill. I believe that the absolute best version of Holyfield was the one that lost to Bo in their first fight. Evander probably beats any other heavyweight on that night, but Bo was on another level. The 96 win over Tyson and 97 revenge over Moore came close, so close that his skills in those fights have to be accounted for in our version of Evander. Therefore, our Evander Holyfield is a mix of the first Bo fight, the first Tyson fight, and the second Moore fight. The Warrior is sure to leave his mark on this tournament. He was never quite the same after the first war with Evander. Bo peaked early and had a short-lived prime, but goodness was it grand. Early 90s Bo could compete with and give hell to any heavyweight to ever lace him up. Game things happened the way they did, especially regarding the Lewis fight, but that's a topic for another video. Obviously, the Big Daddy Bo in our dream matches will be the one who was at his absolute apex against Evander Holyfield in 1992, mixed with the 1995 Bo from the Hyde, Gonzalez, and Holyfield win. The greatest enigma in the history of the sweet science. The most exciting fighter to ever live. The Tyson that was taken to distance by Tony Tucker is underrated. Tucker was the type of fighter that would ultimately plague Mike later in his career. Amazing that Mike was able to outpoint him for the win 
and it provides some merit toward those who claim that a prime Tyson would have beaten Holyfield and Lewis. However, that's not to take away from Evander and Lennox. As for the Biggs fight, that's another bigger fighter that Tyson broke down and eventually TKO'd. It was sweet revenge for Mike and shut Biggs up big time while serving as a masterclass for smaller guys up against bigger guys. But perhaps the most invincible he ever looked was against Michael Spinks. Mike won that fight the moment Spinks learned Mike had been punching holes in the dressing room wall. Unfortunately, Tyson lost the big name fights in his comeback. So we'll be using a more 80-centric Tyson for this scenario. Specifically, the Burbick, Tucker, Biggs, and Spinks versions of Tyson wrapped into one. Bonus points from Quick Tillis, Bone Crusher Smith, Pinklin Thomas, Jose Ribalta, and Razor Ruddock fights. Man, Tyson cleaned the division out in the 80s against some good competition. It's too bad he fell apart going into the 90s. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, go watch this video, linked below. The Mike Tyson Farr simulation, as with Ali, will be a what-if version that maintained his discipline and mastery with the continued guidance of both Cuss and Rooney, stacked with the best we saw of him. He may be the best light heavyweight of all time, and he only cemented himself further by taking the leap to heavyweight and becoming champion in a comeback win over Evander Holyfield. He improvised his style by fighting as a southpaw despite being a natural orthodox righty. With this, he gave himself one of the best jabs in the game. And we can't forget the brutal war with Burt Cooper. His downfall was the punching power latent to the heavyweight division, but he held his own pretty darn well. He had the heart, just not the chin. He could also fight on the inside and the outside, dishing out some solid punishment. The Michael Morer of choice here is the one who beat Holyfield and showed the best of his toughness against Stewart and Cooper. If he'd beaten George Foreman, that would have been a fight of choice too because he was outboxing Big George the whole way. Outside of Italy Klitschko and maybe Evander Holyfield, no one gave Lewis this much trouble. For some reason, merciless Ray Mercer seemed to really have Lewis down. In fact, Mercer seemed to have most 90s heavyweights down. It was the 80s heavyweights that bothered him. He was like a reverse Mike Tyson. They went back and forth and that fight could have gone either way, but Lewis edged it out, and if I'm not mistaken, Lewis calls this the toughest fight of his career. Mercer gave the best heavyweight of the 90s his toughest fight, and arguably won the fight. Mercer's obliteration of Tommy Morrison is also to be accounted for. Therefore, the Ray Mercer of contention will be a fusion of the one who destroyed Morrison and the one who arguably beat Lennox Lewis. Devastating power and focus but just short of being a champion. The man was terrifying and looked to be a new Mike Tyson. When I saw what Tua did to John Ruiz, I was intimidated through the screen. Speaking of which, that's the Tua of interest here. So I'll be combining that Tua with the one that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ike Ibiabuchi in their record-breaking 1997 bout. If it were Tommy Gunn, he'd be higher, but Morrison was solid in his own right. His left hook was killer, and he had solid boxing skill, but he didn't have the chin to last with the killers of his time. Maybe the heart, but not the chin. Perhaps his most impressive victory was the win over Razor Ruddock, or maybe the cautious win over George Foreman. Either way, Morrison gets all of his best qualities in our simulation and I wish the Duke the best. I know what George Foreman said about having a reputation hinged on losses, and he's absolutely correct. But for Ruddock, I'm going to make an exception. He went the distance with a very game Mike Tyson while sporting a broken jaw. He was pounded in this fight and refused to give up. The win over Michael Dokes was solid and is still one of the most vicious KOs ever. 
That shot would have stopped almost any heavyweight and most certainly killed the average man. Maybe Tyson destroyed Ruddock's chin. I don't know. But he certainly didn't have the ability to take a punch too well going forward. Whatever the case, the Ruddock of contention is a mashup of the ones from the Dokes and two Tyson fights. He was never this good before, and he would never be this good again. Lightning in a bottle, that campaign for Douglas, and it's worth noting that I don't think he's a one-hit wonder. He was a solid fighter with a good jab, good form, and fundamental skill. Briggs was a solid knockout artist, who was at his best when he could mow you down in the early goings. This match will feature Tokyo Douglas up against a Shannon Briggs that possesses his 90s youth and blitzing power along with his experience and endurance from his later career. Specifically, the Foreman win, the Lewis loss, and the Mercer win. I ranked Andrew Galata 10th in the 90s documentary. He was a solid contender who lacked the mental maturity to become champion, a quality he wouldn't gain until the late 2000s. Of course, this tournament features the pinnacle of all fighters, Therefore, our Galata of choice is the one from the demolition jobs over Riddick Bow, with the maturity, patience, and experience he'd accumulated by the time of his 2008 upset over Mike Malo. For my prediction, I'm taking Shannon Briggs to win the wild card, but lose to Andrew Galata for the final spot. Let's see what the simulation has to say. Let's go, champ! 15 rounds for the wild card spot and a shot at immortality. The first round was fairly even, with both men showing they could slug. Briggs wasn't able to blast Douglas out, and Douglas was doing a nice job comboing Briggs up. In the second, Briggs stunned Douglas, but he regained his wits and started tagging Briggs back. Briggs was expending a lot of energy, and it was beginning to show early. There was also some swelling around his left eye. To start the third, Douglas stunned Briggs, but this time Briggs regained himself only to take a further beating from Douglas. Now Buster began utilizing his reach through some stiff straights, and Briggs looked ready to go. Shannon continued swinging wildly and was taking some noticeable punishment from Douglas. The third ended with the two exchanging weaker blows as now Douglas was beginning to tire as well. The fourth was a slugfest, seeing both men go for the kill. Briggs stunned Buster with a bad uppercut and sent him to the canvas with a stiff right hook to the body. Douglas answered the count and survived the remaining 20 seconds of the round. The fifth saw further brawling as Douglas continued his straights to neutralize Briggs. Both men were drained by this point and the fight became a battle of the wills. Briggs badly stunned Douglas with a big uppercut before downing him with an uppercut to the body. Douglas again answered the count and the fight resumed. In the seventh, a big right straight stunned Douglas. He was dropped by a bomb left hook and the referee had seen enough to complete the Briggs comeback. Shannon Briggs had won the wild card and will battle for the number 10 spot against Andrew Galata. What a fight. The finale of the wild card round, Andrew Galata versus Shannon Briggs. Again, I predict that Galata will survive Briggs early and outlast him for a late knockout. Galata started strong with the jab and the power punches were flying between both. Briggs hurt Galata who fought back while hurt and survived. The round was explosive as both swung for the fences. Briggs had Galata hurt on the ropes, but was tied up. He continued to catch Galata, but to great resistance from the powerful pole. Briggs hurt Andrew bad near the end of the round, but failed to put him away. Galata was doing better in the third, but Briggs continued peppering him. Briggs had Galata on the back foot until a sudden straight right dropped Galata to the canvas. He rose and continued slugging. Briggs remained aggressive, 
yet patient. The round concluded with Galata refusing to back down. As the stamina game wore on, Galata fared better. Still, Briggs had him on the ropes. He was stunned badly with around a minute left in the round, but survived again. The fifth started with explosive action, seeing Briggs pepper Galata before dropping him with a stiff straight right. Andrew rose again but immediately collapsed to the canvas. Shannon Briggs had earned his number 10 spot, representing the 90s with a fifth round knockout of Andrew Galata. He'd proven me wrong too. If I had to rank these fighters all together, ordered from rank 1 to rank 20 for the sake of our tournament seating, the list would go as follows. Muhammad Ali at a 97 overall. Lennox Lewis at a 96 overall. Larry Holmes at a 95 overall. Evander Holyfield at a 94 overall. George Foreman at a 95 overall. Joe Frazier at a 94 overall. Riddick Bowe at a 95 overall. Mike Tyson at a 94 overall. Sonny Liston at a 93 overall. Ken Norton at a 91 overall. Jerry Quarry at an 89 overall. Michael Morer at an 89 overall. Ray Mercer at a 90 overall. David Tua at a 90 overall. Ron Lyle at an 88 overall. Ernie Shavers at an 88 overall. Joe Buckner at an 88 overall, Tommy Morrison at an 87 overall, Donovan Ruddick at a 90 overall, and Shannon Briggs at an 88 overall. Now we just witnessed the first round, the wild card round. The following are the rounds to come. The right for the fight, which will feature four 10-round matches to determine who will go on to fight in the next round. Vacant champs and challengers will decide the four alphabet titles. The winner of Joe Bugner, Ernie Shavers will go on to fight Muhammad Ali for the WBC title. The winner of Ron Lyle, Tommy Morrison will go on to fight Lennox Lewis for the WBA title. The winner of Razor Ruddick, David Tua, will go on to fight Larry Holmes for the IBF title. The winner of Ray Mercer, Shannon Briggs, will go on to fight Evander Holyfield for the WBL title. Mike Tyson and Sonny Liston will battle for the lineage, while Riddick Poe and Ken Norton will battle for the ring's recognition. In the quarterfinal dream round, the inaugural champions will defend their titles in 15 round matches. We'll see the unification of the lineage and the WBC title, along with the unification of the ring recognition and the WBA title. In Championship Finals Truth, 15 round unification bouts will be held. The lineal WBC and WBO titles will come together on one end, while the ring, WBA, and IBF titles will do the same on the other. From there, we will determine in the final round, the undisputed greatest in a massive 15 round unification bout for every title between the final two heavyweight champions. Hope you're ready for the war zone. First up is the rematch between Joe Buckner and Ernie Shavers. Originally, Shavers won by Dr. Stoppage on cuts over Buckner in two rounds back in 1982. Will the results be the same this time around? I'm taking Joe Bugner by unanimous decision. Ernie stunned Bugner mid-round, 
but Joe recovered and continued calmly with his game plan. He appeared to be baiting Shavers to expend more energy, and it was working. Bugner began to keep Ernie at the end of his jab before being stunned by Shavers to end the round. Ernie had Bugner retreating to start the fourth before Joe backed up a tiring Shavers. Bugner's left eye was almost closed. In the fifth, he stunned Ernie big with a minute left, but failed to drop him. Shavers was gassed, and his left eye began to show some swelling. Bugner had Ernie on the ropes in the sixth, but the Black Destroyer continued battling back. Bugner stunned him big and dropped him a minute and a half in. Ernie rose. In the seventh, Bugner dropped Shavers with a dynamite uppercut around the two minute mark. He answered the count again and was dropped again by a body shot with 30 seconds to go. He beat the count. Bugner finished him with a hook to the body as the referee stopped the fight when Shavers tumbled back to the canvas after attempting to rise again. Joe got me good here. I didn't think he'd score the KO. Bugner is on his way to a trilogy bout with Muhammad Ali for the WBC Championship. Another matchup that happened, but its timing was a bit late. Mercer and Briggs were both past their best. Briggs secured the victory by 7th round knockout. This matchup will see the two at their absolute best. I'm taking Ray Mercer by 5th round knockout. Mercer started the third in control, but was dropped by a monster left hook a minute and a half in. Briggs had Mercer on the back foot before the action returned to a scrappy stalemate. Briggs then stunned Mercer with a big straight right, 30 seconds into the sixth. Mercer stunned Briggs big with a knockdown in the seventh. An uppercut dropped Biggs again in the round, and he would not answer the count. Ray Mercer scored a huge comeback win after losing every round in the fight. I thought Briggs had it in the bag and that I'd predicted wrong. Mercer had earned his shot at Evander Holyfield for the vacant WBO title. This one never happened, but it would have been explosive. My mind immediately takes me to the Tyson Ruddick matches as a framing for the bouts. Just as Tyson took those bouts, I'm taking David Tua, but by stoppage over Ruddick in the sixth. Ruddick started the aggressor as Tua appeared stunned that he wasn't walking back Ruddick. His chin kept him in the bout as he adapted, despite being stunned with almost a minute to go. Tua's chin was carrying him well in the affair, but stamina was another point. He was dropped by an uppercut to the body and saved by the bell. In the seventh, Ruddick dropped Tua with a thunderous left hook. He answered and rose to another big left hook that floored him. He failed to answer the count, and Razor Ruddick had secured his spot against Larry Holmes for the IBF title. I don't know shit about boxing. This one is going to be a slobber knocker. Two contenders who never won the big one, the WBO title was minor at the time of Morrison's reign, and who were inconsistent in their performances. What would happen if a peak Ron Lyle met a prime Tommy Morrison? I'd personally take Ron Lyle by seventh round stoppage. Morrison started the aggressor, but Lyle responded well. The two were missing the massive bombs until Lyle stunned Tommy with a monster right to the body. Tommy rebounded and continued exchanging. Lyle floored Tommy with a left hook in the corner that had him bounce off the ropes near the end of the second. Lyle continued beating Morrison in the third before dropping him with a booming right. Tommy rose, 
and was dropped by a straight right that he failed to answer. Ron Lyle had blasted out Tommy Morrison for a third round knockout and was on his way to a title bout against Lennox Lewis for the WBA title. Guess I shorted Lyle in his ability here big time. And so concludes the second round. Our matches are all set for the third round in which we will decide our six champions. The three match. Ali won the first two and I believe he'll win this one too. Ali by unanimous decision for the WBC title. The two started aggressively, already well familiar. Ali stunned Bugner to end the round. Ali picked his spots better in the third and stunned Bugner as the round wound down. Bugner was cut bad in the fourth. Ali overwhelmed Bugner in the fifth and dropped him. Bugner rose. Ali dropped Bugner again in the seventh and Bugner answered again. Ali ended strong, but now he was cut as well under the left eye. In the ninth, Ali surprised Buckner by dropping him with a right hook that he was unable to answer. Muhammad Ali was the new WBC heavyweight champion by ninth round knockout and the first champion of our tournament. I was surprised by the knockout. I expected a decision either way. Two of the most vicious champions cut from the same cloth. I see Liston doing Tyson in, similar to how he did Patterson, but in extended fashion. Liston by knockout in the sixth. Tyson remained cautious in the third while countering until he was hurt by Liston. Tyson then hurt and dropped Liston with an uppercut while hurt himself. Liston rose and was almost dropped again to close the round. Mike dropped Liston again with an uppercut in the fourth, and he failed to beat the count. Looks like I was way off on this one. I thought Sonny would use the jab more to wear away at Mike before the KO, but instead it was Mike who broke Liston down. Mike Tyson is heading to the next round to face Muhammad Ali in a unification bout for the lineal and WBC heavyweight championships. Foreman defeated Mora to become the oldest heavyweight champion in history. But now he's at his absolute peak. I think Mora still outboxes George at some points, but is ultimately knocked out late. Foreman in eight. The third saw a major shocker as Foreman floored Mora to the canvas after a successful set of combos. He did the same later in the round and again, Moore answered. He dropped Michael one more time before he was saved by the bell. Moore started the fourth strong before being dropped by a thunderous left uppercut. He failed to answer the count, and George Foreman had scored a bit of a comeback knockout. George ended Moore in half the time I anticipated. Very impressive, and he was on his way to a WBO title bout against the winner of Holyfield Mercer. A rematch featuring the two at their best. I'm still inclined to take Holyfield, this time by a unanimous decision. In the sixth, Holyfield caught Mercer with a string of hooks and dropped him. Mercer rose to apply pressure to Evander and win the remainder of the round as he had Evander trapped in the corner. In the eighth, Evander dropped Mercer with a sharp counter right hook. Mercer answered immediately. Mercer's left eye was almost closed, and Holyfield's left eye was taking some damage too. While cornered near the end of the round, Evander dropped Mercer again and he was saved by the bell. They slugged it out until Evander dropped Mercer mid-round. Mercer again answered, and it was clear that his heart and chin were going to get him through this fight. Evander was obviously ahead on points and only needed to survive. Holyfield started aggressive despite this and dropped Mercer again with a dynamite left hook 
that sent him flying across the ring. Mercer stumbled while trying to rise, and it was all over. Evander Holyfield was the inaugural WBO champion by 12th round knockout and would be defending against George Foreman in the next round. Holyfield ruined my prediction by a matter of minutes. A cross-era battle that will put Ruddick to the ultimate test. I see Larry jabbing him to death before finishing him in the 7th. In the 5th, Larry's work was paying off as he stunned Ruddick with a minute to go before flooring him with a straight right shortly after. Razor answered. Holmes ramped up the aggression in the 7th and in a flash decked Ruddick with an uppercut that sent him tumbling down. He answered again and survived again. Holmes dropped Razor again, this time with a body shot. Ruddick struggled to rise, but beat the count. Holmes lured him into a trap and stunned him again before dropping him a final time with an uppercut that penetrated Ruddick's guard. The fight was stopped as Ruddick stumbled on the canvas. Larry Holmes was the inaugural IBF champion by ninth round stoppage and would face the winner of Frazier Quarry. Took two rounds longer, but the knockout was official. They fought before and Frazier got the better of Quarry, one of which was fight of the year. Much of the same here as I've got Frazier finishing Quarry in nine. Frazier started slow, as usual, letting Quarry pound away as he sponged punishment and weaved. Corey was swinging for the stars, attempting to blast Joe out early, as Foreman had done. It wasn't working. Corey stunned Joe in the second, got tagged himself, and the action returned to Corey's aggression. Frazier was showing remarkable patience and durability as he weathered everything Corey had to offer. This fight was beginning to remind me of Lewis Briggs. Frazier upped the aggression and stunned Jerry to the body around the two minute mark. Joe had Jerry reeling as the round neared the end. His body work was already paying dividends. Frazier was cut under the right eye as seen between rounds. In the fourth, Joe continued slipping and tagging. He applied endless pressure, chasing Quarry around the ring until dropping him with a right hook to the body. Quarry answered and was floored by the famous left hook after which he was saved by the bell. Quarry began to fifth desperate for the KO, but was being broken down further by Smoke and Joe. He was stunned by a jab and dropped by a right hook. He beat the count again, only to be dropped again by a chopping right hook. He struggled to rise, but showed great bravery and heart as he barely beat the count. He was then ended by a left hook to the body after a deadly exchange. The action was halted when Quarry stumbled back to the canvas mid-count. Joe Frazier had secured his shot for the IBF title against Larry Holmes in the next round. He'd also finished the Bellflower Bomber four rounds before I predicted he would. We are in for a back and forth war here. I see it playing out like Holmes Norton. That being said, I see Bo being more successful than Holmes was and securing a 10th round knockout against Norton. Both started patient, throwing one shot at a time as Bo smothered Norton. It quickly turned slugfest as neither man was to be outdone in the exchange. The pace continued to increase. In the second, Bo adapted by lunging in with his shots as opposed to staying in the pocket. Bo's chin survived him some big shots and he stunned Norton with 10 seconds to go. In the fifth, Norton slowed down and utilized single, more powerful blows. He'd adapted to Bo's lunging as well. A big jab got Norton's attention at the end of the round. In the eighth, Bo started with the pressure and had Norton on the retreat. Around the two minute mark, he dropped Ken with a big uppercut to which Norton answered. Norton bravely fought back and a brawl erupted mid-ring that saw Norton back Bo up twice before being backed up himself. Between rounds, 
a cut was seen on the left eye of Norton. In the ninth, Bo smothered Norton and staggered him twice before dropping him with a straight right. Norton answered and was immediately dropped by a monster right hook right to his cut left eye. He collapsed back to the canvas mid count and the action was called to a halt. Riddick Bow was the inaugural Ring Magazine champ and would face the winner of Lewis Lyle in a unification bout. Probably the best fight thus far was held here as the two matched up well. I thought it was closer, but the official judges had Bo winning every round but one. He beat my prediction by one round. Lau has a puncher's chance here as I don't see him running through Lewis the way he did Morrison. I also don't see Lau counterpunching to a heavy degree of success. Lewis by knockout on the 8th. Lewis started trying to use his reach advantage, but Lau was surprisingly effective as he pressured Lewis with some early bombs. Lau slowed nearly in and Lewis began to land more effectively, leading to him stunning Lau with seconds to go. Lewis was spotted with a bad cut between rounds. In the third, Lewis stunned Lau big, but he recovered and got back to work on targeting the cut. Between rounds, Lewis's face was a bloody swollen mess despite his winning the fight. Lewis stunned Lau again before failing to drop him at rounds in. His face was becoming grotesque. Lau hit him big with a minute and 10 to go before being floored by a Lewis straight right. Lau rose and was aggressive as Lewis countered in retreat to end the round. Lewis dropped Lau again with a right hook to start the sixth. It was the brutal end as Lau remained on the canvas for the entire count. Lennox Lewis had just become the inaugural WBA champion by six round knockout and was on his way to a dream unification super fight against Riddick Bow. And so concludes the third round. It was an exciting way to decide our six champs going into the dream match round of unification bouts. I was surprised to see how some of the bouts went, like the Bo Norton bout in which Norton hung in there as opposed to being blasted out by the stronger Bo. The Tyson Liston bout shook me too as I didn't expect Sonny to gas himself swinging for the fences. Looks like that's the other side of the coin for the Foreman Frazier dynamic. Hmm. What if George had spent himself trying to crush Frazier and was obliterated? Maybe we'll hold a rematch down the line. Anyway, next round will provide some much needed answers toward who the greatest is as we jump to 15 round bouts. Perhaps the greatest dream matchup of all time. Ali and Tyson at their absolute best. Personally, I'd take Ali as I see him dragging Tyson into the championship rounds and drowning him. Ali by knockout in the 14th. To start, both slipped one another well until Tyson stunned Ali big. Ali was making Tyson miss big, but Tyson was doing the same. Ali opened the second more cautious and landed a good uppercut that backed up Mike. Tyson upped the aggression and pressure but was missing. Ali was landing more and standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kid Dynamite in spurts before getting back on his bike. Mike was using his jab more and going to the body, but Ali continued peppering him from the outside and tying him up inside. Both men were expending a lot of energy. In the sixth, the even exchange continued as both men slowed down. Tyson's face was a mess between rounds and Ali's cut was under control. In a shocker, Ali flash KO Tyson with a straight right in the opening minute of the seven. The scorecards revealed that he was ahead, only having lost the opening round where he was stunned. Muhammad Ali was the new unified lineal WBC heavyweight world champion and would defend his titles in a unification bout against the winner of Holyfield Foreman for the
for the WBO title. These two fought a war in 1991 with Foreman past his best. With both at their peak, this one actually will be one for the ages. That being said, Holyfield by unanimous decision as he survives George's best and brawls well in his own right. The third was a slugfest that saw Holyfield get the better of George while sponging George's best. Foreman adapted well in the fifth and was beating Evander to the punch, but Holyfield still got the better. He was bleeding from both eyes and beginning to swell around them both as well. George became more desperate in the ninth as he could sense he was behind. He was missing big, but hurting Evander when he did hit. George had Evander hurt as the round came to an end, but not in danger of going down. Evander needed to survive. He was gassed, and George knew he needed the knockout. The 11th was the same with George taking the initiative. He'd made his way back into the fight on the scorecards. In the opening seconds of the 12th, Evander exploded and dropped George. Foreman rose and was dropped again by a vicious combo from Holyfield. In a shocker, Foreman failed to rise from the second knockdown and stumbled back to the canvas where the referee stopped the fight. After making up his ground on the cards, Foreman became overzealous and was stopped by Holyfield in another rope-a-dope sort of situation. Evander Holyfield had retained the WBO title by 12th round stoppage and was on his way to a unification bout against Muhammad Ali. Ali's best student against his greatest rival. I see Holmes performing well against Frazier and coming out with the split decision win after being pounded for 15 rounds. He merely wins the battle of volume. Holmes started cautiously on the outside and Frazier targeted the body while covering up. Larry was getting the better of the exchanges, but Joe always started slow. In the second, Holmes stunned Frazier with a straight right around 2 minutes and 10 seconds in. Joe instantly recovered. Holmes covered his body well to avoid being worn down and continued working well from the outside. In the third, Joe began to counter well in the opening minute and remained patient as he continued mixing up shots to the head and body. Larry's chin was carrying him well as he continued toe-to-toe -to -toe with Smoke and Joe. In the eighth, Larry was in firm control and had Joe in a shell, but still couldn't get Frazier out of there. Incredible durability and resistance from Smoke and Joe, and equal patience from the Eastern Assassin. In the ninth, he finally stunned Joe again, this time with that piston-like jab, but Frazier, again, instantly recovered. Near the end of the round, Larry dropped Joe with a hook to the body as the bell rang. In the 10th, Holmes had his way with Joe and used his jab to open him up to a left uppercut that dropped him. Frazier beat the count again, and Holmes got back to work behind his jab. Larry dropped him again with a body shot, and this time Frazier stumbled back to the canvas, leading the referee to stop the fight. Big surprise here, as Larry broke Joe down for a 10th round knockout on his way to a unification bout against the winner of Lewis and Bo. The biggest dream bout and lost chapter in heavyweight history is here. If they'd fought from 92 to 95, I'd probably take Bo. Anytime after, and I'd say that it's gotta be Lewis. Here, both at their absolute pinnacle, I'm taking Lennox Lewis by knockout in the 11th. The fight opened with Lewis the aggressor while he was on the back foot. Bo kept the pressure on and looked to spark an exchange. It was an even enough round that saw both men land well at a great pace. In the third, Lewis opened his lead as he continued baiting Bo in and utilizing his superior reach. Until Bo stunned him, big, with 25 seconds to go. In the sixth, Bo exploded and dropped Lewis with a string of combos. Lewis answered, survived, 
and stunned Bo to end a spectacular round. Lewis's left eye was a mess. In the seventh, Bo took the advantage as he looked fresher. Lewis was stunned big around a minute and a half in and was on his bike. Bo was beginning to win the exchanges but still couldn't overcome Lewis's reach. Despite this, he stunned Lewis to end the round. In the 11th, Lewis got some good counters in as he continued moving back. He ended the round strong with a flurry. In the 12th, Lewis stunned Bo big and overall outlanded him despite Bo applying endless pressure. Who would give in first? In the 13th, Lewis continued on getting the better of Bo, but Bo turned the tide near the end and began to sting back. In the 14th, Lewis finally struck back when he dropped Bo with two vicious hooks after failing to penetrate Bo's chin all fight. The 15th appeared to be the deciding round. They slugged it out, both looking for the knockout. They exchanged well, neither backing down all the way to the final bell. When the dust settled, Lennox Lewis was awarded a unanimous decision in what turned out to be an all-out war. The scorecard showed that Lennox had jumped well ahead after Bo stormed back in the middle rounds. Lewis won the championship rounds and thus the fight. He was the new unified ring WBA heavyweight champion and on his way to a unification bout against IBF champion Larry Holmes. By far my favorite round of the tournament so far and I think it'll remain my favorite. Some awesome dream bouts for unification between men who I could see beating one another on any given day. Lewis and Bo was everything and more than I expected, with both coming so close to finishing one another throughout the fight. The biggest shocker was Ali over Tyson by the flash KO. Completely caught me off guard and Ali has surprised me twice now. Holyfield coming back to stop Big George was another thriller and Holmes managing to somehow gas and break down Joe Frazier of all warriors upseated me. A round of surprising outcomes, and I'm excited to see the next set of unification bouts between Ali Holyfield and Lewis Holmes. Two warriors, two champions, Two very faithful men. I imagine the battle of the gods would come up in the build up here as it did with Tyson and Holyfield. That being said, it could go either way, but I'm taking Ali by a very tight unanimous decision. Ali started slick and blitzed Evander with his speed. Holyfield got a few good ones in as he struggled to acclimate to Ali's speed. The pace was immaculate. In the second, Holyfield began to time Ali better with his jab, but still struggled to match Ali's speed. In the seventh, Ali found his key, the uppercut. He tagged Evander at will and dropped him in a flash to end the round. He was saved by the bell. Holyfield was a bloody mess. In the eighth, the tide had turned as Ali continued penetrating Evander's defense. His chin kept him in it as Ali peppered him on the inside and outside. In the 10th, Ali became overzealous, but still managed to drop Evander with a straight right. The real deal answered and covered up as he attempted to survive. In the 11th, Ali dropped Evander with the same uppercut that turned the fight around. Holyfield failed to answer the count and to my own surprise, Ali had scored another knockout en route to the final round in which an undisputed champion would be decided. Another prediction of mine shat on by the greatest. He was the new, unified, lineal, WBC, WBO heavyweight champion and awaited the winner of Lewis Holmes. 
We're in for a war. The two men I have potentially beating a peak Ali. Two of the most underrated, overlooked champions in history, and they're going to show exactly why here. When the dust settles, I have Lewis taking a tight, unanimous decision after a bloody war of back and forth action. However, I wouldn't be surprised if Larry pulls this one out either. Though Larry struggled initially, he was already showing signs of acclimation. Lewis was fighting at an accelerated pace. In the second, the pace slowed despite a few exchanges between the two. Lewis was showing patience of his own as he grew more accurate in targeting the cut. He landed the jab almost at will. In the sixth, the big black cloud started strong with a string of lefts and was proving to be the better conditioned of the two as his consistent pace remained. Lewis had slowed on his back foot. Holmes was closing the gap, slowly but surely. In the seventh, Larry began to counter very well as Lewis struggled to keep him at the end of his jab. Holmes was the one in control of the jab game now. In the eighth, Holmes stunned Lewis to start and continued the pressure as Lewis stood his ground. Lewis upped his pace and was landing, but not hurting the big black cloud. Holmes dropped Lewis with a perfectly timed counter straight right around the one minute mark. Lewis appeared stunned and blitzed by Larry's durability. In the 12th, Lewis floored Holmes with a monster straight right. He answered, exchanged, and was dropped by another straight right. He failed to answer this knockdown, collapsing back to the canvas like a bag of bricks. Lewis showed tremendous heart, courage, and willpower in this win. He rebounded from losing the momentum, gassing himself, and being knocked down to score a stoppage in the 12th. Holmes appeared to take his better conditioning for granted and gassed himself, leading to his demise. Lennox Lewis was the new, unified, ring, WBA, IBF heavyweight champion. The undisputed title bout was set to be contested, funny enough, between the two best fighters of their respective eras. The 70s and the 90s. What era is taking the undisputed title. Both of these fights could have gone either way in my opinion. If Holyfield avoids the uppercut, he advances. If Holmes continues forcing Lewis to match his pace, he advances. Tremendous round that saw the better men emerge. This is it, the final bell. It ended up being the two best of the two greatest eras. I've been on record as saying that I see Ali, Holmes, and Lewis as the holy trinity of heavyweights who could all beat one another on any given day. I don't really know who to go with here, just as with Ali, Holmes. Uh, this one could go either way. This time around, my gut is telling me to go with Lennox Lewis, a 12th round knockout. Not too sure, but we'll see. They started feeling one another out from the outside. Despite Lennox's reach advantage, Ali was using clever timing, angles, and his speed to lead with his own jab. Usually when one connected, so did the other. But Ali was getting the better of Lennox, ever so slightly. Around a minute and 10 seconds, Lewis got some good shots in. Muhammad Ali was expending a lot of energy. In the second, they exchanged jabs and Lewis used his size to force in power punches at range. Ali took them well and stuck to the plan from the outside. Lewis was backing away well and sponging Ali's sharp shots. In the third, Ali stunned Lewis around two and a half minutes and backed him up. 
Lewis struck back strong and had Ali on the back foot. Lewis was hitting Ali at will almost. He floored Ali with a 1-2 to which Ali answered and survived the remaining 5 seconds. His left eye was worsening. Ali slowed in the 4th, looking for better windows and preserving his energy. Lewis dropped him again with a straight right to the chin and the greatest answered again. Lewis stunned Ali in the 6th around 2 minutes and 5 seconds. Ali recovered and the action returned to a standstill. This continued until Ali stunned Lewis in the eighth with a straight right in the opening seconds. Lennox recovered, composed himself, and returned to exchanging. Ali dropped Lewis with a left hook in the ninth. Lennox answered and remained on the defense. Lewis decked Ali with a right hook in the 10th. The Louisville lip stumbled on his way back to his feet and failed to answer the count. Lennox Lewis was now the definitive, undisputed heavyweight champion of the golden and silver ages of boxing, having unified the lineage, ring magazine recognition, WBC, WBA, IBF and WBO titles. The Lion had trumped the greatest and now sits atop the heavyweight mountain alone. And that's it. How do you feel about the results? Who were you rooting for? I had Lennox winning the whole thing and I'm satisfied to see that he did. Let it be known that this video is the official beginning of a new series here on The Charles Jackson. The What If series, in which we'll see just who would win if we pit the famous names across time against one another. There were some matchups we missed out on here in the tournament, and they'll be covered in future installments. Here's hoping you enjoyed the tournament, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Stay frosty, gang.